Our next speaker is Mary Simmerling, Vice President of Quality and Safety at New York Presbyterian Hospital. She's also on the faculty in the Department of Medicine, Healthcare Policy and Research, as well as Public Health. Dr. Simling is an expert in human organ transplant ethics with extensive publication and great international influence. She's worked with the Ministry of Health of China in their efforts to regulate organ transplants and abolish organ trafficking. She's also worked a lot with human subjects protection, so again, this overlap of research and transplant. Mary. Thank you. Thank you. So um, it's so great to be back in Chicago. I want to thank Lainey and Mark for inviting me and also the McLean family for making this possible again this year. Um, it's great to be here. So I usually put a lot of text in my slides because I'm a philosopher by training. And today I tried something a little bit different. I have images of text in my slides. So we'll see how that goes. So I want to um, focus today on some of the potential financial and social complications um, from living organ donation, and in particular as they relate to post-donation satisfaction with life. So um, we saw earlier that um, Mark talked about his paper from 1989, and I also want to go back and talk about this paper. This is actually the paper that was the basis of my entire dissertation uh, in organ transplant ethics. So although it's uh, 27 years old now, I think that the key ethical issues, focus, uh, the, the focus of it, really remain important issues for us today, and most especially the issues of consent. Um, so I think that the three main issues that Mark and his colleagues identified in this paper have to do with balancing risks and benefits, donor recipient selection, and informed consent. And their discussions of the risks and benefits to living donors and the importance of voluntary informed consent really help us tell the story of how our thinking on these issues in general has evolved in the last 25 years. So for those of you who haven't read it, uh, Mark did mention um, some of the key concepts of it. The way that I look at this piece is that it's fundamentally about the moral and regulatory path to introducing new and innovative medical interventions with unknown risks and areas where there are precious few alternatives and significant mortality. And in this case, it has the additional complication that the risks that are being introduced are being introduced to a healthy person um, who is motivated by a strong desire to save the life of their child. And at the time, the question that came up uh, more often than not in this case was, who would say no and who could say no? So it's interesting to reflect on Megan's presentation uh, with that in mind. Both in this paper and in general, the potential risks to donors have really solely been focused uh, on medical risks uh, for a long time um, of the procedure itself. And I know that uh, Lainey mentioned that and so, and so did Dick. And conversely, the potential benefits to donors have really been thought to be primarily psychological. And in the case of a successful transplant from a parent to a child, the donation that uh, Singer and colleagues uh, noted in this paper was that it could include, quote, extreme satisfaction in having saved the life of your child. And the risks and benefits of donation are important not only because of the fact that they indeed form the basis of the justification for living donation itself, but because of the critical role they play being the information piece of informed consent. But as we've heard uh, from the presenters before me, that's not the only part of consent that matters. The voluntariness of the consent is also really essential. So with regard to safeguarding the voluntariness of consent, um, Singer and colleagues in this paper identified three potential countervailing pressures, external pressures, pressures related to, this, to the um, urgency of donation, and internal pressures the donor might him or herself feel. And importantly, they identified that these pressures were really important in the decision-making process. So they established a protocol to mitigate the pressures by selecting recipients who are not in urgent need of a transplant, by creating a state decision-making process over a period of time. And this was intended to remove the urgency of the situation, but also the urgency of the decision-making process and the time frame. Aspects of this protocol continue to be used as a gold standard for the informed consent process even today, and uh, also in the form of donor advocates and waiting periods. So what do we know now that's different than 25 years ago? Well, we know some more about the medical risks associated with donation, although as Laney and others have mentioned, uh, the long-term data remain very limited. 
But we also know that there are a lot of non-medical risks factors that maybe we should be considering as risks. Uh, there's now a substantial body of research that establishes that there are additional factors besides the medical risks of the donation procedure that are also important in informed consent decision making, including post-donation quality of life and also, more recently, post-donation satisfaction with life. So I'm going to focus on satisfaction with life. Satisfaction with life is different and distinct from quality of life because its focus is subjective and psychological and measures um, the personal judgments one has about one own, one's own life, and it aims to identify the gap between what one would expect one's life to be like, given the choices one has made, and what one's actual lived life is like right now. And so if we think about this and the responsibility for voluntary informed consent for living donors, it really requires we put them in the best possible position not only to assess the risk and benefits associated with donation, but also to be able to apply those judgments to their own life and their own circumstances. Recent research by Messer Smith and colleagues published in 2014 identify some of the factors that, that impact post-donation satisfaction with life. And although the findings of their study uh, are limited in a number of ways, uh, there's an absence of a pre-donation assessment of satisfaction with life, an absence of candidates who chose not to donate, which would be an important thing to, to uh, important group to hear from, reliance on recalled experiences that range over a number of years from five years uh, to 48 years, and a sample that is less racially and ethnically diverse than and more related to their recipients uh, than most of the U.S. living donor population. Still, some of their findings suggest that data related to post-donation satisfaction with like among this cohort of donors um, d d deserves more attention and may be generalizable to other types of living donors. So what they found is that overwhelmingly, the majority of donors, 85% in fact, um, not only reported being satisfied with their lives, but that satisfaction was significantly associated with their recalled donation experience. In fact, some of them even achieved the extreme satisfaction that Singer and colleagues reference in their paper um, and said that the donation experience was, quote, the high point of their lives. But there are others who were less satisfied, including some who wished they hadn't donated. And the reasons for the differences between those who believed donation had a negative impact on their lives and their, sa and their satisfaction with their lives really merits further consideration. So again, satisfaction with life is distinctive because it's a subjective measure of the difference between the judgments about one's life of what one had expected and perhaps one, what, what one should have expected given the choice one has made and what they're actually experiencing. So some of Measure Smith and colleagues' findings substantiate and inform concerns um, related to both informed consent and voluntary aspects of consent, including motivations to donate and how they may or may not be related to recipient outcomes. What they found is that donors who were pressured to donate, or conversely felt pressured not to donate, had lower scores of satisfaction with their life. Moreover, while the pressure to donate or not was related to lower satisfaction with life, they found that recipient outcome was not associated with any changes in satisfaction with life. This reconfirms that the voluntariness of the informed consent process is paramount and suggests that providing willing donor candidates the opportunity to donate is in itself important, regardless of whether their decision to donate achieves the ultimate goal of improving, extending, or saving the life of the recipient. And again, this is consistent with what Singer and colleagues speculated in 1989 that it's important that we safeguard the voluntariness of the consent process by establishing protocols to mitigate pressures on donor candidates to donate or not. And also, even if transplantation fails, the donor may take comfort in the knowledge of having done everything possible they could to save a life. I want to turn now to some of the informational aspects of informed consent with a focus on the risks. Messrs. Smith and colleagues also found that financial burdens associated with, uh, with donation were associated with lower satisfaction with life. And donors who reported financial burdens because of the donation, whether there was problems paying bills, um, whether they had to take unpaid paid medical leave from work to donate, um, or whether they had to take an extended time to get back to work, reported lower satisfaction with life scores. And while this isn't surprising, it's, I think, an important observation of the study, and I want to connect it to yet another McLean Center alumni's work, uh, Peter Ubel. 
So UBAL and colleagues um, recently published um, about toxic uh, costs and, um, and risks as side effects from uh, side effects that should be considered in informed consent discussions. So they recommend that as part of full disclosure to patients, out-of-pocket costs associated with medical interventions should be considered as side effects and explicitly included in discussions about the risks and benefits of particular interventions. They suggest patients should be informed about potential financial costs associated with interventions so they can be allowed to decide for themselves whether the potential benefits outweigh those risks slash costs. In the context of living organ donation, information about potential financial burdens of donation may play an important role in judgments about the risk benefit assessment potential living donors make and so I think should be included in the informed consent process. However, as you and colleagues note, these costs are often uncertain in general and they may therefore be difficult to describe. And I think that this may be particularly true in the context of living organ donation where the donor patient is an otherwise healthy person taking on financial and other risks that he or she would not otherwise face. And I think the available tools and I'll show you one here, the Live Donor Toolkit from AST. The available tools and information intended to help potential donors estimate and understand these costs are really of limited value due to the number of variables and unknowns in this context, not the least of which are the costs of potential additional care and the risks of losing insurance. Um, there's a website, Living Donor 101, that estimates the costs uh, for uh, the out-of-pocket costs between $550 and $22,000. Um, so you can see that that range is pretty wide. The completeness of the voluntary informed consent of living donors really remains essential to the permissibility of living, do living donor transplantation. And while the calculus potential donors use in making judgments about the risks and benefits of donation and the impact of those decisions on their own lives and circumstances remains poorly understood, the donation experience seems to impact donors' satisfaction with life in measurable and meaningful ways. In some contexts, the experience may enhance our satisfaction with life, and in, other, in others it might diminish it. But getting a better understanding of the factors that impact post-donation satisfaction with life will further improve the informed consent process. This information may also position us to be better able to anticipate and also mitigate factors that have a negative impact on donor satisfaction with life and support those that enhance it. And in this way, it may also help us to close the current gaps between donors' expectations of what their lives will be like after donation and their actual experiences of what their life is like. Thank you very much. I don't know if I have time for questions.